anyway, welcome to Valley View Baptist Church in North Ogden, Utah, and to our YouTube friends throughout the world. We, we're glad that uh, you're with us today, and we look forward to uh, worshiping with you. So, as always, we're speaking about our abundantly able God from Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. As always, we are, must remember that faith defeats fear. Faith defeats stress. Faith defeats anxiety. Faith defeats discouragement. And faith defeats depression. Yes, God is still on his throne. Yes, God is still in the miracle business. Yes, God is still all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present at the same time. So with that in mind, let's just look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we come to just present your word, simply recognizing, Lord, the truth of the word, the leader of the word, the history of the word, it's important. We pray that we can learn through the message this day. And we ask, Father, that your spirit dwell supremely. May the words go forth in the power of the spirit be received in that same power. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I do have a little story I want to share with you. Uh, and I'll get back here, I'll do it this way. This little article was in uh, Sword of the Lord some years ago. It says, how to get what you want. The Bible says in Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Notice the little expression, give and it shall be given unto you. The Bible does not give what, does not say what to give. It only says give. If I understand the verse, it means we get what we give. If a man wants love, then he should give love and love will come back good measure pressed down and shaken together and running over. If a man wants kindness, he should give kindness and kindness will come back. Good measure pressed down and shaken together and running over. If a man wants others to smile at him, then he should give smiles and smiles will come back. Good measure pressed down and shaken together and running over. Whatever you want, then that is the thing you must start giving. This simple, this same principle is taught in the golden rule. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do even unto them also. Matthew 7, 12. The same principle is taught in Galatians 6, 7. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So smiles and reap smiles. So frowns and reap frowns. <clears throat> Show, sow kindness and reap kindness. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Speak kind words and you will hear kind echoes. Something that's all available to to uh, each one of us. So I encourage you uh, to do that. So with that, that in mind, uh, we will uh, begin our message and the text uh, uh, which Gary read earlier was Genesis uh, 35 uh, verses one, two, and, and three. I won't repeat them, but I will kind of share Share some thoughts with you on them. This is a this is a message of renewal. It's a message of going back so we can go 
more forward. It's, it's a message, you know, Jacob of old, we need to return to early Christian joy, to sweet promises, to meet God afresh, be newly commissioned and renew holy vows. You know, we really need periodically to just, just sit down and just talk to God, kind of renew our love for Him because His love for us is already in the room. And so we need to uh, think about that. I read an article about John Wesley, which was one of the uh, original leaders of, of the early, early church. And he had a never to be forgotten experience in Aldergate. There he felt his heart strangely warmed and by faith he knew that he, even he, was forgiven and justified. Saul of Tarsus met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus with a light brighter than the sun. There his proud heart surrendered to the Savior whom he had before hated. He was saved, then called to carry the gospel far hence to the Gentiles. Neither John Wesley nor Saul of Tarsus could forget his crisis experience. Jacob had his Bethel, an experience as tremendous as that of John Wesley or Saul of Tarsus. So Jacob, after many weary years, is called back to Bethel, back to a renewal of his vows and to a new fellowship with God. A new call to, the, to be heard of a nation and the ancestor of the seed of Abraham, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Every person who knows Christ as Savior has had his place of blessing, his place of Christian joy and assurance, his place of holy vows. And all of us might well, like Jacob, hear the call of God to come back to Bethel to receive afresh the promises of God and to renew the holy vows we made before and the fellowship once so sweetly enjoyed. I remember my first Bethel. It was on an island called Okinawa. Okinawa was an island about four miles wide and 40 miles long. That's about, about it. There was a tremendous battle, World War uh, II there on Okinawa. Well, I happened to be in the, in the orderly room and I saw some things on the bulletin board. And one was I could get a free to my record three-day pass if I wanted to go to a Christian retreat. See, that wouldn't be allowed on a bulletin board today. But this was 1953. <laughs> Okay, so I thought, wow, I'm tired. The trip to Okinawa was kind of awkward. Somebody told me to uh, get the high bunk in the, in the ship be, because if the lower bunk, then they got sick in the night, then they puked on you, okay? <laughs> so, so I'm saying, I'll take that top, see? Well, Nobody told me that hot pipes run right across the, the, the top and I, I sweated all night, but I didn't get any puke. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, so I, I signed up to go to this retreat and it's, uh, it was up several miles uh, out of, you say, relationship with anything. It was, but the government had built some uh, uh, 
the government had built some housing uh, there and, and uh, they, they put up tents and, and it was kind of a Christian retreat that I, I didn't, I just wanted the time off. So come about the second day, I thought, these folks have something that I don't have and I want it. So I went to one of the leaders and I says, I, I don't know how to say this, but I don't fit here, but I'd like to fit here. And he says, have you a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And I says, I don't have the slightest idea. So we went over in a tent, there was straw and those old uh, chairs, you know, those slats in the, in the back and folded and some of them had missing slats in them and anyway we sat in that in that tent one afternoon on Okinawa and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Now I can't go back to my Bethel, okay? But I I've, I've had several Bethels since since then. And I refer back because there were some missionaries there that they, I was on the, uh, <clears throat> the Far East uh, radio network giving my testimony with uh, in interpreters there, and that was a, a thrill. I was in some of the, the, the little villages, and, and the, the missionaries there would go from village to village, and, and they took me on several occasions with them and let me give my testimony to about my newfound friend in Jesus Christ. And, and there was a, also a, an interpreter uh, there. So I had that, that opportunity. And I think back on that uh, for all those, those years that, uh, and then when I came stateside, I, I went to Allapada Baptist Church in North Miami, Florida. How did I know that church? It was because one of the chaplains on Okinawa said, when you go home, I want you to, to call this. I called him as Dr. Haldeman was his, his name. He had been president of the Southern Baptist Convention, very large church. So I, I called him. He had me uh, sit with him during the worship service and stand up and give my testimony to several hundred, hundred people. That same church, just a, a few weeks later, had a revival. And my sister, my precious sister, Eleanor, walked down the aisle and accepted Jesus Christ. Amen. That's a Bethel, too. Amen. I'll remember that. She's in heaven now. She was six years younger than me, but she got, she got cancer. But when she found the Lord, she and her husband went to uh, work for child evangelism, and she wrote a lot of the literature that's still on the uh, table as far as uh, the, <coughs> the, that, that ministry is concerned. Lee and I one time went back to uh, Pennsylvania where they were training and doing things and we were spent a day or two with them in their, in their ministry there. That's a Bethel uh, too. So I, I guess I can say I've had a lot of Bethels, okay? But I've had a lot of trials and tribulation as well. But I'm back to Bethel, okay? And I hope that through this message that we can all get closer to our, to our Bethel. When I accepted this pastorate here, many times I would come over and, and sit at the first pew and read my Bible and then step up here and kneel all alone, but talking to God 
about what he wanted me to do. And I had many Bethel experiences. And a lot of you folks have walked the aisle to a establishing of Bethel, so to speak, a place that you really got close to God with and, and you know, time is a healer sometime, but time is a mess sometime because we can do the wrong thing. Well, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about Jacob, okay? You understand now when I say we need to go back to Bethel, what I'm, what I'm uh, uh, talking uh, about. Well, Jacob had a twin brother. His name was Esau. In answer to the beseeching prayer of Isaac, his barren wife, Rebecca conceived. When the twins struggled within her, she prayed and God revealed this to her in Genesis 25, 23. Two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one woman shall be stronger than the other and the one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. Well, that's Genesis 25, 23. It's kind of interesting. God telling them what it is and the situation before they give, before Rebecca gave birth. So before they were born, God had planned to make Jacob the head of the promised nation and the ancestor of the seed, which had promised Abraham, the savior through whom all nations should be blessed. Boy, if that's not a Bethel, folks. I mean, that's just, that's long-term stuff. <laughs> so, how, so how did Jacob get the birthright and the blessing? God, who made such plans, had put some holy hunger in the heart of the boy Jacob. He believed what he had heard his father Isaac tell, the ownership of the land of Palestine, the headship of the nation, the ancestry of the blessed seed, was to come through Abraham and Isaac and one of these boys. You with me? Okay. Without knowing how God had planned to work it out, Jacob, <clears throat> traded the hungry, tired Esau born first. He gave him bread and pottage of lentils for his birthright, which was expected to go to the first born. See a little deceit there? Hmm? See a little problem there? You see how he fled Bethel, okay? So later, when Isaac was an old blind man, he instructed Esau, the firstborn, to bring in venison and prepare it for such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. That's Genesis 27, four. Rebecca, now the mother of the two, Overheard, she knew what God had told her. The elder shall serve the younger. So she schemed with Jacob to pretend to be Esau, to dress in Esau's garments and serve quickly prepared meat of kids instead of the venison. So old and blind Isaac was deceived and gave to Jacob the birthright which he thought he was giving to Esau. Now that's a long story, but I, need, I think we needed the, the situation here to maybe understand a little uh, better. So God intended Jacob to have the blessing 
and it was a prophetic blessing, but it need not have been sought by deceit and fraud. Human nature, right? Good illustration. Okay. Esau penitently sought now to get back to the birthright which he had bargained away and the blessing which he had missed. But on this matter, he repented in vain. God had chosen Jacob to be the head of the Jewish nation and to enter into the covenant made with Abraham and Isaac. We can imagine how angry Esau was that his crooked brother, for we read in Genesis 27, 41, and Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will slay my brother Jacob. Getting pretty nasty, isn't it? Getting pretty raw. Why? You see how sin entered in? You see how selfishness entered in? You see, when when mom just overheard something, she thought, no, I want Esau. Okay? God was saying, I want Jacob. Okay? Conflict with God right, right out of the place. So, well, dreading, the wrath of Esau for her favored Jacob. Rebecca arranged to have Isaac send the young man back to Padam Aram to get a bride uh, from the daughters of Laban, Rebecca's brother, <coughs> lest he should marry some heathen woman among the Canaanites. So Jacob, running for the wrath of his brother, running from the wrath of his brother, and shame before his father, left home and headed northwest. (laughs) It must have been a sad journey, away from the mother he loved and from his old father whom he had deceived and from familiar surroundings. He had no money, he had no company. When the dark came upon him, he was near a place called Zuz, Z-U-Z. There was no inn, there was no friendly home, no pleasant bed available. So he gathered rocks together to prop his weary head and slept on the ground. Well, now there's a ladder involved, okay? So as sad and lonely Jacob slept of weariness, in a dream heaven opened. There was a ladder set up on earth, reaching to heaven. The angels of God ascended and descended. God stood above the ladder and said, in Genesis 28, 13 through 15, folks, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. To thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into the land, into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken of thee. This is God speaking to Jacob. Well, Jacob woke up. (laughs) His his soul must have been in agony. His body must have been kind of weary, sleeping on rocks uh, all all night. So partly with the fear he woke up that sinful mortals must have... when they came into God's presence and partly with the glory of God, presence and promises, he said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. He's asking in verse uh, 17 of that 28th uh, chapter of Genesis. God 
was in a place where the lonely man lay his weary head and slept and he didn't know it. He didn't know it. But God was with Jacob all that, all that night. Why? Because God had made a promise to Jacob that it was going to happen. And in verse 18 and 19, and Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that had, he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil up on the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. Well, the Hebrew word Beth means house. El is the Hebrew word for God. So Jacob called the place the house of God. Okay? That's his first Bethel. Okay, we got him, got him there. So in verse 20 and 22, Jacob vowed a vow, saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I can come again to my father's house in peace and then shall the Lord be my God and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give a tenth unto thee. So, you see, Jacob is vowing, okay? Be careful when you promise God something. He may hold you to it. <laughs> okay, so, how could Jacob ever forget that holy night? The awe-inspiring scene of angels who are uh, usually invisible to mortal eyes, the glory of God shining above the stairways to heaven, the voice of God speaking to his heart, and what glorious promises that he should have a multitude of seed, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That promise could only be fulfilled by the coming of the Savior the seed of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. So what are we saying here? You see, God protected the lineage all the way from Abraham through the Old Testament to the birth of Jesus Christ. Amen. It was all protected by God, and God protected it very, very strongly. So. And so, uh, <clears throat> the promise was not only to his descendants, but God had promised to be with him and to keep him and bring him again in peace to the land of Canaan on the basis that God would do what he had said, would care for his needs and bring him again to his father's house in peace. Jacob had made three lifetime promises. Let me just share. First, then shall the Lord be my God. Okay, that's the first one. Okay. Is this the time when Jacob first knew forgiveness of sin and opened his heart to the saving grace of God? Is this the time when his heart was renewed and changed? When he became a child of God? Perhaps it was. We know that he had believed in the God of his father, had wanted the spiritual heritage of the firstborn, but now there is an outright decision. Then shall the Lord be my God. What's that tell us? That's when Jacob had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which we all need to have, okay? We don't, we, sometimes we get the R of religion as opposed to the R of relationship, okay? Religion doesn't get you anywhere, but relationship does. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ 
put you on the road to eternity with him. So it's very personal. Second, the stone that had been his pillow. He set it up and poured oil on the top. Henceforth this stone, this place, was to be to him the house of God. So he called it Bethel. The name which has remained some 3,700 plus years. Isn't that interesting? Last of all, Jacob made the holy vow. Of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. This was the first of two or three climatic, spiritual, mountaintop tops in Jacob's life. How could he ever forget the presence of God, the holy promises, the serious vows, which involved all his loyalty, all his will, all his love, all of his possession. Well, my dear friends, in YouTube land here at Valley Vale Baptist Church, did you not have a Bethel also? It may have been when you were saved. What about the time when God revealed himself to you? He did that to me on the island, on the island of Okinawa. Okay? When he called you, when he encouraged you, when there was repentance or holy vows, or a new start. So you too, each one of us, undoubtedly have had a Bethel, your place of blessing, those times of special divine call and intervention, and those times of decision. Do you remember? The time when you vowed you would have upon you continually the breath of God, the power of the Holy Ghost, and perhaps you set apart a time for the morning watch. You kept a rendezvous with God in the secret place of prayer. I have that every, every morning. I love to come to the office my office and talk to God quietly yet sincerely every every day to to be wow so of all who hear me who are saved have some Bethel which you ought to go back to I do not doubt that to many a heart who, who hears this, God has said, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee. You ought to answer to all your family and those about you, and let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. So if we go back to our text and read that third verse, I just read part of it uh, here. This is when after God had spoken to, uh, to Jacob, and then he says, after God says, you, you get up now, you go to Bethel and you dwell there and make yourself, make an altar there. And, and so uh, Jacob, he, he went and said to his household and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments and let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which thou went. 
and, the, and verse 4 climax it for us. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earnings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed. They went back to Bethel. What I love about this is God told Jacob, get with it, Jacob. You need to go back where this all started. You need to go back where the angels climbed the ladder up and down. You need to go back where I, <coughs> where I was with you all night and you didn't even realize it. You need to go back to the blessing of a relationship with me. And you know, Jacob didn't hem haw about it, you know. What, the next verse says, come on folks, pack them up. We don't want any of your, we don't want any of your false gods. We're not going to take them. We're leaving them. We're going back to Bethel. Amen. And I'm going to build an altar. Yeah. I'm going to build an altar. Do we need Bethel? Yeah. We need we need Bethel. I hope this was uh, an interesting message for us. Sometimes we just have to get back on track with with our Lord and Savior. And if you don't have an if you don't have a Bethel, name something that you've been to and through that really made an influence on your life, and let that be your Bethel. Because that's always a good starting, restarting point, you know, when we need it. So from my heart to yours, that's my simple message of <laughs> back to Bethel. Back to Bethel. You know, like back to Salt Lake City. Back, people can come back here. Those are Bethel. We've had many people over the years, years say. Okay? So you have a Bethel. Think. Think now. Oh yeah, I remember when I walked an aisle and asked Jesus to forgive me and come into my heart and be my savior. Oh yeah, I remember that. Think about it, find that. Make a little note in your, in your Bible. Now, my Bethel is someplace, write it down. And when you open your Bible, just, yeah, there's my Bethel kind of draws you right to the things of God. So, so my friends, with closing, I will give you the invitation here or at anywhere that you're hearing this, this message. The invitation is to, if you don't have a Bethel, you can have one today. You can have one right where you are, and that will be your Bethel. It's where you really met Jesus Christ. He forgave you your sins and he came into your heart through the Holy Spirit and dwells there for forever, forever, forever. And so let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we've, we've tried so diligently here, Lord, to present you to everybody because we all need a Bethel. And so, <clears throat> simply put, I guess it's kind of the land of beginning again, because that's where we, where we really got right with God. So I pray, I pray for each one listening that you will find your Bethel. You will establish your Bethel today if you don't have one, and if, you, if you're saved, and you're looking back, find your one of your Bethels and let and key into that. And I just pray that you just open your heart to our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Well, my friends, it's that simple, okay? But what is amazing to me is through all the journeys with Jacob, God was with him once he established is Bethel, okay? So think about, think about that. And we'd love to hear from you. Just Valley View Baptist Church, Post Office Box 12653. 
Ogden, Utah, one two six five three. Oh, I said that twice, didn't I? So well, I've had several Bethels here, so I said, so uh, that's okay. So anyway, it's just our simple address. We'd love to hear from you, and and God, God bless you. Thank you so much.